Hello, and thank you for joining us for another inspiring message from Journey Church. To learn more about our ministries, please visit us online at journeychurch.org. Now here is today's message. Good morning. Uh, my name is Leo Alves, and I'm the youth pastor here at Journey Church. Um, hello, hello. Good to see you guys. I might get the privilege to lead our Journey Next, our youth ministry, and I'm so thankful. I love those guys. Um, praise God. Yeah, Journey Next, where are you at? Are you in here, Journey Next? I see a couple. I see a couple of students. We got to get the rest from them. There they are. What's up, Journey Next? There they are. I love those guys. But hey, um, I'm feeling it for Pastor Eric today. He's under the weather, unfortunately. So why don't we just take a second right now in the beginning of service to pray for our pastor. Amen. Don't you guys love Pastor Eric? He's an awesome pastor. We want to pray for him. So Father, right now, God, we pray that you would meet Pastor Eric wherever he's at. God, we pray that you would bring healing to his body, that you would strengthen him, God, to come back stronger than ever to preach your word. Father, And we thank you for the awesome man of God that he is. We thank you that he is the pastor of this church. And Lord, we pray that you would bless him and bless him and bless him, even this morning, Father. Heal his body in Jesus' name. And the whole church prays, amen, amen. amen. All right. So today, I want to continue on with the message that we're on called Game of Life. How many of you guys were here last week when Pastor Eric preached the message and he talked about the, the game of life? The choices that you take, where your choices will take you. You guys remember the message where he brought out the game board? It's actually right down here. The game of life. And I have a confession to make. I have actually never played the game of life. This game was a little bit before my day. It was the original board game, and I actually never played that game. So today, the game that I want to highlight is, is a different one. It's a more modern one. It's the one that the teenagers in my youth group love. The game is called Call of Duty. Yeah, all my teens are like, yeah. Call of Duty is, is a game that the first one was kind of like a reenactment of World War II and stuff. It's a first-person shooter, and it's a great game, and... and and it evolved to now they have Call of Duty Modern Warfare, I believe, and all of this stuff. But I have another confession to make. I have never played Call of Duty either. My teenagers love it, but I'm horrible at video games. I'm just not good at first-person shooters. The one game that I play is a basketball game. And the reason why I play is because I love basketball. I love sports. And, and that's the only, seems like this is the only game that I'm good at, sports games. You know, thank you. Yeah, I see you, Joseph. Yeah, so NBA 2K is my game. But I know that my students, they love this game called Call of Duty. And it's a game about war. It's a game about battle where, where, where players they actually get to take part in a war. And, and it's kind of cool. But um, I want to bring up another game now that I believe was the original war game. There was original battle game. And it's called Risk. Yeah! yeah! You guys remember Risk? I love this game. I remember playing this with my cousins in Brazil and just doing like all-nighters, risk battles. I love it. Do you guys, how many of you guys played risk before? How many of you have like your strategies, like how to take over the world, how to dominate the globe? Do you guys have that? I, I do. I'm not going to give away all my secrets, but I just want to let you know that if you want to start out in Australia, that's a good plan, but the better one is actually start off in South America. Take hold of my country, Brazil, because once you dominate South America, then you can start invading either America or Africa, and from there on, begin your global domination process. So that's my strategy. I'm not going to give you the rest, but that's how I win. I challenge any of you to a battle of risk, and we think, let's get it on. <laughs> I love risk. I'm good at risk. But um, anyways, with all joking aside, today um, I want to talk about how we have a call of duty to the next generation because our teens are at risk. Like how I did that, just call of duty and risk, put it together. We have a call of duty to the next generation because our teens are at risk. So if you guys please turn with me to Matthew 9. Verses 38, verse 37 and 38 for me, please. And Lord, I just thank you today. God, I thank you for the opportunity to preach your word. Father, I pray that you will anoint me to speak and that you would grace us, will open our hearts to receive what you want to speak 
tonight. God, I thank you for this opportunity, and I pray that you be with us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, so Matthew 9, Jesus, you know, fully God, became a man. Jesus is walking all over the towns of, 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 of Israel, and, and he's preaching the gospel. He's healing the sick. He's raising the dead. He's multiplying food. He's doing a bunch of amazing, amazing stuff. And as Jesus does that, we see the multitude to start following Jesus, right? And then this verse says that Jesus looked towards the multitudes and he had compassion on them. So he said here in, in, in verse 37, he says, Then he said to the disciples, The harvest is truly great, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray that the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So Jesus is saying that there's a great harvest, but the laborers are few. I want to say today that there's a great harvest to be had in the youth of America, in the youth of Jacksonville. And we're seeing it here, even at Journey Next. There's a great harvest. Man, God is doing awesome things with the youth here at Journey Church. Um, just last week, we had our back-to-school block party. And it was awesome. We had so much fun. We had games. We had food. We had basketball. We had worship and, and, and a message there. And we packed the house out. Uh, we had 138 students. That's like, that completely blows my mind. Actually, I, had a, I made a challenge to our students in the beginning of the year. I said that if, if they can get enough friends to come to, so that we can have 80 students in, at, at Jordan X at any time, as, a, as like a reward for their efforts of inviting their friends, I will let them shave my head into a mohawk and color whatever color they want. Now, when I made this, when I made this promise, I, we, like, I had no idea that we could even reach that. I thought 80 was a safe number. You know, they'll keep them going for it. Last, day, last Wednesday, we had 138 students. It's amazing. So next week, you guys might see me with a crazy mohawk painted all kind of crazy colors. So I'm just warning you, um, it's not by my choice, it's because of the youth. <laughs> so God is doing amazing things, and you know, that was a great week that we had last week, and all those students, they got to hear the gospel, and that's what it's all about. And the reason why we want more students to come is because we want them to hear about Jesus. I tell the students all the time that if they love something, if they're excited about something, they want to share it. I believe that should be the same about Jesus. If they love Jesus, if they're excited about what God's doing, they should want to share that with their friends. And I know they have the desire because I follow them on Instagram. <laughs> whatever they like, whatever they had for breakfast, you know, whoever they're hanging out with, they want to post a picture online so people can like it, so people can see it. You know, they get excited about something they want to share with the rest of the world, right? That's what Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, that's what it's all about. You know, you're sharing the things that you're excited about. And I want them to share about Jesus because they are excited about Jesus. They, they are falling in love with Jesus. They're growing in a relationship with Jesus. So that is the reason why we want to see them reaching out to their peers. Amen? Amen. And it's happening. They're, 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 I love my students. I love being a youth pastor. I love, I love getting to preach the gospel every week. I love getting to minister to them. I love getting to go to Itching and Touching the River with them and, and going to Five Guys with them and, you know, just being a part of their lives. I love being a youth pastor. And there is a great harvest in the youth today. More and more, we see more students coming, and I'm still consistently aware that there's so many more out there that are lost. There's so many more out there that don't know Jesus. There's so many more out there that are struggling. So the harvest is very, very great. And the laborers are few. Now, don't worry. I don't, I don't want this to be, you know, a, a, a volunteer message trying to get more people to help our journey next. You know, this is not what the message today is about. Although, if you would like to, you know, you can see me or Sarah after service. It will definitely make a space for you. But the message today is not about getting more people to come and join, you know, and help journey next. The message today is about something deeper than that. I believe that the need of today's youth is greater than what any youth ministry can provide. I believe that their great need goes so much deeper that no youth ministry, including ours, can deal with the issues that are going on in their hearts with the great need that they have. 
You know, I love, you know, you fast for I love you for ministry. I love that we get to hang out with them, feed them, have fun, worship with them, play sports with them, and preach them the gospel. And that's awesome. And I love, I love, I love, I love what that does. But there's something deeper that no youth ministry can touch. And I believe, I believe that issue is families. I believe that issue is fathers and mothers raising up sons and daughters. Turn with me right now to Malachi chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. This is the prophet Malachi. He's prophesying about the end of the age. He's prophesying about the end times. And how many of you guys know that the end times, there? I, I don't know when Jesus is coming back, but every day that we live, he gets a little bit closer. <laughs> you know, we're seeing the time, the signs of the times, even now. So here we go, Malachi chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. Malachi says, Behold, I send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord. And when he, and when he comes, he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with the curse. So Malachi, is, is, he's talking about this, this Elijah guy who will come and turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the heart of the children to the fathers before Jesus comes back. And he gives a warning that if that doesn't happen, that the land will be cursed. There will be utter destruction. And, and I believe the reason that he's saying that, the reason that he's prophesying that is because that this, heart of, the hearts of fathers being turned to their children and children being turned to the fathers, that is the very will of God since the beginning of mankind, since the creation of the world. I believe that's what God had in his heart. God chose to reveal himself as father. He was the original father. He was the original maker. And I believe that he set up the entity of family to be able to be a picture of his relationship with us, of his love for us. So what we saw at the fall of man, we saw a rebellion where the hearts of the children turned away from their father and turned to other things. And I believe that what we're seeing now is a complete disconnect of fathers and children of the family structure. Sons and daughters are rebelling against their fathers and mothers, and mothers and fathers are turning away from their children. And I believe in, Pat, last, last week, Pastor Eric talked about, you know, the kind of the decline of the, the so-called moral Christianity in America. You know, he's saying that in the 40s and 50s, you know, almost every single home was a Christian home, that we could not elect anybody into office if they weren't Bible-believing Christians, and how we had that kind of that standard Right, the standard of godliness, the fear of the Lord across the land. That was around the 40s and 50s. And, you know, in the 60s, we saw a great wave come and turn the tides of our nation, right? We saw the sexual revolution. We saw the rise of the, the drug culture. And we just saw this great shift beginning to happen where children rebelled from their fathers. Where the youth, the young adults of America, they, they said no to the ways of their fathers and mothers, and they decided to go on their own route. And I believe that we're seeing the results of that today. I believe that we're seeing, you know, a after that great shift happened, we started seeing the decline of the family the way that God was created it to be. And he leads us to where we're at now. The great rebellion of the 60s leads us to where we're at now, which is an almost fatherless generation. There's some crazy stats out there about saying that in some urban settings, that for the first time in history, there are more kids going to bed at night without a father in a house than the ones that have a father in a house. It's crazy. It's a fatherless generation. And you know, we can even see it here in our youth group. You know, we, well, I kind of did an a, a informal survey, but I found out that Almost 75% of our students come from broken families or don't even have a dad in the house. That's scary when you think about it. And it shows. You know, another, about one-third of our students don't even have a, a, a family that goes to church. They don't even have a Bible-believing family. A lot of our students here, they come here because they love what God is doing at Journey Next and because their friends are inviting them, but their, their, their family actually do not go to church. And on the contrary, they actually try to stifle what God is doing. 
that breaks my heart. Man, we just had, uh, we took our students to summer camp this year, and we saw major breakthroughs.